Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, bienvenidos. On behalf of the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies and the Department of History at the CUNY Graduate Center, we are pleased to host this evening's book talk entitled Agrarian Puerto Rico, Reconsidering Rural Economy and Society with authors Dr. Laird Bergad and Dr. Cesar Ayala, moderated by Dr. Teresita Levy. I am Victoria Stoncadena, the Associate Director of the Center. I'd like to take, our, uh, take a moment, thank our team at Clackles, Andreina Torres and Lydia Hernandez in particular for organizing this event. Um, as a note, we will be recording this event and plan to share it on our YouTube channel uh, available via our website. We will share the link via the chat to our website. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Teresita Levy, a dear friend and colleague. Um, Dr. Levy earned her PhD in history in 2007 from the Graduate Center and has been at Lehman College since. Her book, Puerto Ricans in the Empire, Tobacco Growers and US Colonialism, um, was published by Rutgers University Press in 2014. Professor Levy is currently at work on a new research project that examines the movement of people within Puerto Rico from 1898 to 1940. Professor Levy continues to be involved in the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the Grad Center, where she advises students enrolled in the Masters of Liberal Arts program. Professor Levy teaches history of Puerto Rico, history of Latin America and the Caribbean one and two and the history of the Dominican Republic. Dr. Levy, thank you for joining us and for moderating the panel tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. It's so good to be here. Um, and I am looking around to see who's here and there are so many friends that are joining us. Um, so thank you all for being here. It always feels like um, a family when we talk about Puerto Rican history. Um, so I am, I am so, so happy to be here. Um, you know, I, Clackles was my home. The Center for Latin American, Caribbean and Latino Studies was my home since its founding in 2000. And I think a, a, a lot of my success, I, I always credit with my experiences at the center and, and working with all the amazing people that have come through there, uh, some of them who are here today. Um, so thank you, Victoria and the rest of the staff for inviting me to participate. And uh, today we have, uh, of course, Laird, Laird and Cesar uh, speaking about their new book, Agrarian Puerto Rico, Reconsidering Rural Economy and Society, 1899 to 1940. Uh, Laird is a professor of history at Lehman College and the Graduate Center and is the founder and director of the Center for Latin American, Caribbean and Latino Studies at the City University of New York. He received his PhD degree in Latin American and Caribbean history in 1980 from the University of Pittsburgh. He has written and published five previous books about rural slave-based societies during the 18th and 19th centuries in Puerto Rico, Cuba and Brazil. And uh, yeah, I should tell you for you know, the sake of transparency that Laird was also my professor, my mentor, and is now uh, my colleague and dear friend. Um, and I really could not be more pleased uh, to be here with him. And Cesar is a professor of sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he teaches comparative historical sociology, economy and society, and sociology of Latin American in the group. He earned his PhD in sociology from SUNY Binghamton in 1991. Cesar is the author of numerous publications on Puerto Rican history. And uh, also to be transparent, I had uh, the great privilege of having him uh, sit in my dissertation committee uh, way too many years ago to mention. So uh, I am among family. So thank you for having me. And, and thank you Laird and Cesar for being here. Um, my own work on tobacco growers in Puerto Rico owes a lot to both Laird and Cesar's training, mentoring and their own body of work. We have known each other for over 20 years and even after all that time, I am still their student. I am excited, Laird and Cesar, to hear you speak about this work. Um, so let me tell you more about what we're doing today. Laird and Cesar are going to speak and we're gonna let them do their thing. Um, and we're gonna have ample time for questions and answers afterwards. Um, but you should feel free to at any point raise your hand and ask a question and I will um, just invite you to please use your raise your hand feature. Um, you can, uh, it's pretty easy to find if you just go to your, to the participants. And what it will do is it will put you in order as soon as you raise your hand. So I will be able to see you and call on you. And then you, I change it so that you could unmute yourself. Um, but if you can just raise your hand, that would make it better for everybody to have a turn at, at speaking. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Also, please feel free to use the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat and the hand raises to, to help us uh, do this um, uh, as, as seamlessly as we can. So, and I think Andreina just posted something on the chat to please unmute um, whenever you're ready to speak, okay? For now, you're fine. Um, you can stay muted so that there's no echo while Laird and Cesar are speaking. So um, in the meantime, uh, we can be muted and then we'll unmute when it's time for question and answer, okay? So without further ado, thank you, Laird, up to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> First of all, I want to uh, thank everyone in attendance here on this momentous day uh, when it seems as if democracy in the United States may have been saved. Um, as a student of history, I recognize uh, the coming of fascism when I see it, and that's exactly the path that we were going down as a country. Uh, so uh, this is a very important day, obviously, in American history. And thank you all for being here on that day. And I might add one thing. Uh, there is little question that Puerto Rican voters in Philadelphia played a very critical role in tilting Pennsylvania uh, toward a Biden. Uh, Latinos in Pennsylvania comprise about 6% of the population. And I've been following voting patterns for some time. Uh, clearly, uh, the Philadelphia Puerto Ricans, uh, as well as Latinos in Allentown, Bethlehem, and other places played a very important role in tilting Pennsylvania. Enough of that, uh, although it may be a more interesting topic than what you're about to hear. Um, Cesar and I began this project back in the uh, early, in the 1980s. Um, we had both uh, worked in Puerto Rican archives. Um, uh, in my case, from the time the Archivo General uh, de Puerto Rico was established uh, in the early 1970s. And we both had written books about various aspects of Puerto Rican history. Uh, my first book was about the coffee economy uh, in the 19th century. Uh, Cesar studied uh, in, a, in his brilliant American Sugar Kingdom, uh, the um, economy of the island, as well as in Cuba and Puerto Rico. and. Uh, when we got together as colleagues at Lehman College, we'd sit and talk about our research, about our work, as most professors do. Uh, and it was very clear to both of us uh, that something was amiss, something was wrong with the accepted narrative of Puerto Rican history in the early 20th century. Um, I'm going to generalize a, bit of, a little bit about that narrative, but what it basically saw was uh, an invasion of an imperialist aggressor uh, we certainly would not uh, contradict that interpretation that proceeded to move into the island and take over every single aspect of social, economic, uh, uh, and even to a certain extent, cultural life, imposing institutions, political, social, economic, taking control and revitalizing a sugar industry, which became the uh, most important source of export capital. Uh, of, of, of exports and uh, thus sources of dollars to the Puerto Rican economy, taking over the uh, tobacco industry, at least the manufacturing sector. Um, and as part of this narrative of this omnipotent uh, imperial power taking over the island uh, was uh, one theme which uh, Cesar is going to speak about uh, in a little bit, uh, this idea that Puerto Rican landowners who had supposedly been very widespread prior to the 1898 invasion, were somehow deprived of their land, which was taken over by giant uh, monopolistic um, uh, sugar corporations from outside of the island. Now, um, something was wrong here. When I studied the coffee economy of 19th century, and was looked at the central highland zones, the municipalities of Lares, San Junta, Sutuado, Marical, uh, Ciales. Uh, I discovered from archival research that in fact, by 1898, most Puerto Rican rural residents did not own land. That this idea of the ex existence of an extant yeoman peasantry uh, in Puerto Rico on the eve of the United States invasion was totally erroneous. And yet this interpretation of the island's history is found ritually in nearly every single work on the island's early 20th century uh, socioeconomic structure. Um, Cesar in his book on American Sugar Kingdom, and certainly Cesar, you can uh, speak to this, and I think this is quite well known, 
uh, underline the fact that despite the presence of these large scale absentee sugar companies, Puerto Rican producers controlled the bulk of sugar production, the majority of sugar production on the island, the production of cane and the production of sugar. Now, these two findings, my finding in the 19th century, that in fact, the vast majority of rural residents in the central highland coffee producing zones of the island did not own any land whatsoever. In fact, I estimated that the percentage of landowners was about 10%. 10 to 15% of all families owned land in the Central Highland Coffee Districts at the end of the 19th century. The fact that Cesar found and underlined the fact that Puerto Ricans played a major role in the sugar industry, that this was not just a question of absentee capital, led us to pose a series of questions uh, which we hope we have answered in this book. So let me make a couple of qualifying remarks to you before I turn this over to Cesar. Um, this is not a political history. We do not dispute the colonial structures of the island. We are not in any way, shape or form in our presentation and in our narrative justifying colonial rule. Uh, it's not our purpose to engage these topics. Two, we are not addressing the cultural issues which have been such a central part of scholarship over the last 30 years. This book is an old school, socioeconomic and demographic history of the island. It is based on systematic data as opposed to anecdotal data, as opposed to selecting few numbers of cases and generalizing about them. We have looked at tens of thousands of records in order to support uh, the assertions that we make in the book. And I wanna stress that uh, very importantly, because as I tell all my students, before you read a book, read the footnotes. What are the sources that what you are reading are based on? If they're not based on systematic evidence, then they border on fiction. I'm sorry to be so harsh. I'm sorry to be so direct, but I have read too many books that are based on 10, 12, 13 cases that are used to generalize about overall populations. I simply want to reiterate that our book has presented a overwhelming number of graphs, an overwhelming number of statistical tables, because we feel that this was necessary in order to harness the data to uh, present systematic evidence to support our assertions and our conclusions. With those introductory remarks, I turn this over to my esteemed colleague, Professor Ajala. Okay. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So um, the way, um, you know, this book has been a long time in the, in the making. In fact, most of that time we haven't been working on it, but I actually went to uh, Puerto Rico in 1998. Um, uh, seeking information that Laird knew about um, and looked at the municipal taxation records in the island. Uh, the US colonial government established a municipal taxation system in 1905, which was organized by municipios, where tax assessors would go and assess the value of every property on the island. Um, and when I say every property, I mean every property. I have seen taxation records of them taxing a boil, you know, like a palm house. Uh, you know, saying it's worth five dollars and taxing them on five cents or something like that. So they are very thorough these taxation records, and I'd like to share my screen here to say how we designed this study because um, what we try to do, since our narrative is an insurgent narrative in the sense that it is contrary to really about one hundred and five percent of existing historical narratives in Puerto Rico. I mean, I mean this seriously. Everybody has said the same thing and we are against the current. So we thought we'd have to show overwhelming evidence that what we're saying is right because there's been a lot of disbelief about what we're saying. Let me share my screen. Um, let's see, can you see my screen now? Yeah, okay. So we chose uh, 10 municipios. It's really 11 because Yauco split it to Yauco and Monica. Um, 
you know, for study. And what we did is we chose some on the coast uh, that would be, you know, Manatí, Fajardo, Macao, San Isabel. Some of these, some of this region here, um, and, and San Germán, Yauco also, uh, because we wanted to represent sugar cane growing municipios, which tended to be on the coast, tobacco growing municipios, which tended to be on the central east, and then coffee growing municipios, which tended to be on the central highlands in the west. One of the problems in Puerto Rico is that municipios span ecological zones. So for example, Yauco, its coastal zone, Guanica, was uh, 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 a sugar producing region, but, but its highlands, you know, just three miles, you know, of the road uh, begins to be, you know, mountains and, and that's coffee region. So we picked these uh, municipios and we sampled them. So what, what we did is uh, I went to the taxation records and I don't have a picture of the taxation records, but they were handwritten records in sheets about maybe 14 by 21 inches wide. Um, and we gathered the taxation records for these municipios overall, I'm sorry, uh, you see the total here, we punched in into a database 73,000 uh, property records. I'm not gonna say farm records because in these municipios, the, the solares del municipio, their urban properties are also are also listed. So we have to kind of, you know, separate them, but about, but the overwhelming majority of properties, about 45,000 of them are farms actually. So, and you can see by year, we did this in the year 1905, in the year 1915, in the year 1925, and in the year 1935. Mostly because at that point, we did know something which we learned later. Uh, uh, we, at that point, we did not trust the US census data because it contradicted, as Lair said, our, our own kind of you know, research that we have done on, on other things. And the people that had defended the, uh, dominant narrative uh, had uh, broadly quoted the same thing over and over again, which is uh, data showing that the number of farms decreased catastrophically in Puerto Rico between 1910 and 1920. And because we were skeptical of that decrease, we, we went to look at the taxation records themselves. Subsequently, we learned that there was no diminution in the number of farms. The census of 1920 did not count farms of less than three acres. That's why there was a very big decline in farm ownership. But at the point where we started to set this out, uh, we didn't know that actually. We found out in the process of writing this book. So we have triangulated data. We have data from these farm records, which we punched in in a database. Um, there's 11 variables um, in, the, in the data that we looked at. Uh, the municipio where the property is located, the record number, the owner ID, the gender. You can tell this by the name. There's very few names in Spanish that are not gendered. Um, at the type of property, for example, Finca Rustica or some other municipio, the size of the property in Cuerdas, Cuerdas is more or less equivalent to an acre, the assessed value of the land, the type of improvement to the land, for example, if you have a, 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 a rancho de tobacco, like a, a tobacco drying uh, a barn, uh, or if you had a sugar mill, the value of improvements to the land, that is the value of those improvements, then you have personal property, trucks, cattle, movable property and then the value of the personal property. So this is really a kind of a sense of, of the rural wealth of the island, uh, farm by farm. And that's what, that's one of the sources of data that we used to, to crunch this number. Um, as Laird suggested, the established narrative was one which uh, we refer to in the book uh, as the narrative of the uh, uh, La Legión de Propietarios, the legion of proprietors that supposedly existed in Puerto Rico before 1898. This is a phrase from uh, Nationalist Party leader Pedro Albizu Campos, he used to say it, that there existed a legion of proprietors and that after the US uh, invasion, they disappeared. Um, but it is not something exclusive to the Nationalist Party. In fact, all political sectors uh, said the same thing, that there was a massive disappearance of uh, of a small farmer. And chapter one of our book is a review of all of that literature throughout the century, political literature, historical literature, sociological literature, where everybody's repeating the same thing. Uh, the small farmer disappeared, the large corporations took over. And so this kind of one-sided um, uh, narrative of colonialism had emerged uh, and we were very skeptical of it. But from our sample, we have, Laird can talk about, he crunched some very interesting numbers on the census. Uh, but from our samples, we can see that the number of farms in these 10 municipios increased over time. And in fact, 
once we, once we started looking at this data, uh, we realized that there is a process of acquisition of farms by, by US capital, correct. And there's somewhat of a process of land concentration. But a bigger process that had not been talked about in the literature is a process of land fragmentation through inheritance. And that's because in Puerto Rico, uh, you cannot disown your children. All children forcibly inherit from their parents. So properties tend to be fragmented. There are no laws of primogenity such as existed in some European societies to preserve the integrity of the states. So land continues to fragment over time and the number of farms uh, continues to increase on the one hand. On the other hand, there's a proliferation of new farms, especially in the tobacco zone, something contrary to what we have been told. We have been told farmers disappeared. In fact, the total number of farmers increased in some places, new layers of farmers were created. Um, and let's see, mean farm size decreased. This is contrary to the, to the narrative of land concentration. Uh, median farm size decreased, as you can see from 1905, uh, uh, to 1935. So, um, you know, already when we crunched the first numbers, which were from 1905 and 1915, and we wrote an article in 2002, we realized, uh, yes, our skepticism was, was uh, warranted and, and we were up to something. Um, I won't go through all the details of the book, but the book basically has a, a review of the established literature and what he has said about property ownership. Why is this important? Because 70% the population lived on the countryside during this period. We're talking about the great majority of Puerto Ricans. When we're talking about rural Puerto Rico, we are talking about Puerto Rico. The cities uh, you know, were uh, kind of, you know, uh, much less population. As late as 1940, like 65% of the population is still in the countryside. So, um, yeah, so not to burden you, I'd like to show you one last thing. And this, we, uh, we, uh, uh, we knew fairly early on when we had the data for 1899 from the US, from the War Department census. There's, there's a decennial census in Puerto Rico in, 18, uh, in 1910, 20, 30, and so on and so forth. There's a wonderful census carried by the New Deal in Puerto Rico and its agency called the Puerto Rico Reconstruction Administration in 1935, which was also used. And we've also used the War Department census right after the invasion in 1899. Why is that census useful? Because it tells us the degree of land concentration before the US companies have time to take to set up shop. So this is a graph here that shows, and there we'll explain this later on, but we calculated the percentage of uh, the population in the countryside that did not own farms, the percentage of the population that is landless. And uh, if you know um, anything about the history of Puerto Rico, you know that this corridor down here, which is all red, is where the Aguirre Sugar Company uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, was 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 the boss. So it turns out, already over eighty percent of the population in this corridor was dispossessed when the Aguirre Sugar Company came in, uh, uh, which means that land did not become concentrated because the U.S. sugar companies came in and dispossessed the farmers. On the contrary, it means that the U.S. sugar companies. Uh, logically came and bought a lot of land in the places where they could buy a lot of land, which is where land was already concentrated. And they could buy it in large chunks, which was this corridor that are here. The same holds true for the headquarters of the Fajardo Sugar Company, which is this one here. You see that whole area, the municipios were different in 1910, so I have to merge them. And in Guanica, which is you know the largest central in the islands, over 70% of the population was already dispossessed. So, um, we think we have the history upside down. It is not the case uh, that the US sugar companies came in and dispossessed the farmers. As a matter of fact, there was a proliferation of farm owners also in the sugar industry because um, you can hold thousands of acres in cattle uh, and just run cattle in it, but you cannot plant uh, thousands of acres in sugar cane unless you have huge amounts of capital. Uh, and so this led to fragmentation of land ownership and leasing of land also in the sugar zone. So the story was completely upside down. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll stop there, but um, uh, our book looks at kind of a big miss in, in, in Puerto Rican social and economic history, which is the miss of the dispossession of the, of, the rural, of the rural population. That process was pretty much complete. 
by 1898 when the U.S. came in. And what we have is a situation where already existing structures of land concentration change hands, right? Maybe U.S. owners buy some land from some large local landowner, but the structure does not change. The structure remains fundamentally the same. So we believe we have a situation where kind of the fate, the economic fate of the colony is kind of overdetermined by the weight of its past, which is namely that this is a Latin American society, which is which like all Latin American societies, has a tremendous degree of pre-existing uh, land concentration already uh, when the US when the US takes over. I'll stop there and relay it back to there. Unmute. All right, can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so let me see if I can figure out how to share the screen. Share screen. Should be one, the other, yes. Yes, share. Okay. All right, so now we're going to present you with some data. <clears throat> and as I tell my students, some of whom are in this audience, it's not the data that are important. It's the story that the data tell. The numbers are there as evidence for a narrative. And it's the narrative that is important. So you can't, you have to see the forest through the trees. The trees are necessary without presenting concrete a systematic evidence. Any responsible social scientist or humanist should not be able to make <clears throat> very convincing arguments. Now, what we see here in this graph is uh, the origins of the mythology that is repeated in work after work after work after work about the disappeared legions and proprietors. Albizu Campos made this famous, but uh, as we point out in our book, this idea that Puerto Rican smallholders were deprived of their land is found in every work, whether it's the 1930s, whether it's the La Nueva Historia in the 1970s, whether it's the work of Sedep, wherever it is, we find this repeated over and over again by rote. What is the evidence? The evidence is the dramatic decline in the number of farms between 1910 and 1920. You can see that the 1910 census indicated over 58,000 farms on the island, 41,000 farms in 1920. Oh my God, cataclysm, Puerto Rican farmers, farmland was being gobbled up by ruthless absentee corporations. <clears throat> now, you'll recall about a half an hour ago, I invoked the importance of reading footnotes. Well, it's important to read footnotes of the Census Bureau and understand how it is that data was collected or data were collected, you excuse me. As I poured over the footnotes <clears throat> from the United States volumes and from the volumes of Puerto Rico, I found a little footnote defining what is a farm that should be counted by census takers. And that footnote said, don't count farms under three acres that don't have a production value of $100. Bingo, bright lights went off. The decline in farms between 1910 and 1920, which is the evidence that work after work after work after work site by road was illusory. It didn't exist. There wasn't a decline in farms. There was a decline in the enumeration of small minifundia or small holders. And that is borne out by looking at farms under 10 acres. Farms under 10 acres declined from nearly 32,000 to nearly 16,000. That's 92% of all farm declines as reported by the Census Bureau were in these small farms. Now, I understand that rural history and agrarian history is not something in vogue and not something very popular. However, I have studied agrarian societies for the past, I hate to say this, nearly 50 years since I started graduate school. <clears throat> and this does not happen outside of catastrophic events such as war, 
uh, natural disasters such as hurricanes, you don't find this massive reduction of farms in this relatively short period of time. Uh, and so it's quite clear that the so-called evidence used to justify this whole theme of a disappeared legion of proprietors or small holders uh, was based on erroneous data. And that is confirmed by looking at the 1930 and 1935 census data, where lo and behold, farms appeared. Not the same number that existed back in 1910, but there was a healthy recovery of farms and Nearly 90% of that farm increase between 1920 and 1930 was small scale properties under 10 acres in size. Verifying this data, we looked at the 1935 special census data, which is one of the most remarkable censuses ever conducted in any country of Latin America. And we find confirmation of these data. Once again, the increase in farms was in these small holders. So this 1920 data from the census, which is the evidence that has been pointed to over and again by work after work, is completely erroneous. And thus, all interpretations of that focus on this um, uh, loss of land by Puerto Rican farmers are absolutely wrong. And that requires a revision of every single notion about Puerto Rican economic and social history in the early 20th century, if you take that into account. Okay, so digest that. You can ask questions about that later. These data from the Census Bureau, which are unparalleled in Latin America, there is no place in Latin America that has a statistical record that is so detailed as we find in Puerto Rico. We don't find anything like this in Cuba, although the 19th century data is very rich. We don't find it in the 20th century. We find it in no other country of Latin America. Now we corroborated these data. Cesar made reference to the tax records, a land by land, a land by land census counts, which revealed the same kinds of patterns. So we looked at two different sources to test this, to see, you know, are we barking up the right tree here? Are we really looking at the right evidence? And the answer was confirmed by the tax records, which, which verify this. All right, so that's one thing. Uh, let's put that out of the way. Uh, um, I have been dying to try to discover the manuscript census returns. Uh, as far as I know, I don't know where they are. I, I've been to the Library of Congress. I've been to the National Archives of the United States. Can't find the manuscripts. Uh, okay. So let's move on to the next slide. All right. Laird, there's a, there's a question in the chat. Can I interrupt you for a second? Um, well, uh, since, Rafa, you've been, since you've been so nice about it, yeah, why not? Thank you. Rafa is asking, um, is there any specific reason for them to have done such a good census at this time? Is there any specific reason what, I'm sorry? That the census, that such a good census was done at this time. Did the Americans have any reason to do such a good census at this time? Yeah, of course they did, because Puerto Rico was considered a territory of the United States. And the United States carried out the Centennial censuses every 10 years in all of the states. And that goes back to 1790. All of the census data are available from 1790 for the United States in, in raw data form. And decennial censuses were carried out from 1790 uh, forward for all states of the United States and all territories occupied by the United States. So there's no, if there's a suggestion that there's some Machiavellian conspiracy here, we wanna know what's going on in Puerto Rico. This is just part of the routine activities of the Census Bureau of the US. And I might add that the censuses in Puerto Rico, including the famous War Department census of 1899, were carried out by Puerto Ricans. They weren't carried out by, by US officials. The census of the counting was supervised by Puerto Rican supervisors. The census workers were all Puerto Ricans. Uh, so these were people hands-on who knew the island and knew the districts where they were making enumerations. Thank you. Cesar, do you wanna, do you wanna add anything to that? You're, I'm gonna unmute you, Cesar. No, I just want to say there is a remarkable census done in the middle of the Great Depression by the Puerto Rico Reconstruction Administration and, and the U.S. Census Bureau jointly. But uh, it was a, a kind of an emergency census carried out under conditions of extreme hardship. 
1935, and it is a spectacular. It's even better than the other yeah. than the other uh, census. It's, it's actually the best census in the 20th century, the uh, uh, Puerto Rico Reconstruction Administration census of 1935. And, and Kathy's asking precisely about that census and, you know, did it have to do with New Deal policies? Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Thank you. Laird? Okay, so now let's look at the issue of land concentration. Now, we are not disputing the fact that absentee sugar companies from the United States, the Sugar Trust, came to the island and occupied extraordinary extensions of land. This is quite clear. Uh, the literature is quite clear. Many of the secondary studies by some of the scholars who may be in attendance today have revealed this. Uh, this is without question. But as Caesar indicated in his presentation, these companies moved into areas where land was already concentrated. There is a mythology that somehow absentee companies came into Puerto Rico and stole the land of Puerto Rican farmers and Puerto Rican farmers were victims. Victimization is so appealing. Uh, that's not the case at all. Uh, basically, these sugar companies moved into areas in the South Coast and the Northeast Coast, De Fondo, uh, where land was already highly concentrated and where land was, where land, uh, landlessness, which I'll talk to uh, about, as Cesar alluded to before in a moment, uh, was widespread. So the idea that corporations went into areas and somehow uh, in some sort of illicit way acquired the land of Puerto Rican farmers is beyond the pale uh, of, uh, of historical error. Now, let's look at land concentration. Fundamentally, the process of land concentration doesn't change very much between 1910 and 1935. And you can see here that this graph, this table here, which again, are hard data that tell a story, show that yes, the number of farms declined, that is large scale farms over 500 acres, but that the area of land that they occupied conspicuously remained very stable. Uh, 662,000, Acres in 1910, nearly 663,000, the exact same amount of land in 1935. Percentage of all land controlled by these large scale farms or plantations, if you will, remains relatively stable. Right. So there is no real process of land concentration that occurs on the island between 1910 and if we went back to 18. 99, you'd find the same thing, except the data in the 1899 census is data for cultivated acreage as opposed to actual ownership. So the process of land concentration doesn't exist. Land was already concentrated. By 1910, it was concentrated. 25 years later, same degree of concentration, right? So if there are any questions about this, I'll feel free to ask. And let us keep in mind, it's not simply absentee corporations that own large estates over 500 acres. These are Puerto Ricans, happen to be extraordinarily intelligent, very astute, didn't roll over and play dead in the front of US corporate investment, but rather took advantage of the market opportunities that existed to establish large scale farms that produce cane or produce sugar to profit. The victimization interpretation of Puerto Rican history is an insult to Puerto Ricans because it denies what most of us refer to as agency. An agency can take many forms. It doesn't have to be political agency, but economic agency and taking advantage of market opportunities that never existed within the Spanish colonial system. Because a broader question here, and I will move on to landlessness in a moment, a broader question is what happens to the economy of a country and a society that is taken over by an advanced industrial power with an extraordinary capital and technological resources? Is it simply a question of victimization and colonialism or are new opportunities created for subject peoples? 
Spanish colonialism has been romanticized, perhaps not intentionally, is some era where Puerto Ricans sat around under palm trees, tocando cuatros and singing and dancing and everyone owned a little piece of land as if Spanish imperialism and Spanish colonialism was benign. The fact of the matter is it was not benign, it was ruthless, but it was backwards. Spain was a capital poor country, a technologically poor country, a country that could not create the kinds of economic opportunities that were created for people after it was taken over by an advanced industrial imperialist and colonialist power. All right, that parenthetical digression, digression a kind, I'm not justifying American colonialism. I'm not painting a picture of some sort of society that everyone achieved uh, prosperity or equality, but without question, there is a sector of Puerto Rican society that made out quite well in an economic sense because of US imperial rule. rule. Okay, let me move on. Laird, we have another question in the chat. Before oh. we get to land concentration. Um, can you compare, or how can you compare the number, this is from Libya, thanks Libya. How can you compare the number of farms with productivity? Um, and she mentions in the equation, you know, are there, is there, do you consider soil conditions? How do you, how do you do that? Wait, the question is looking at productivity? Yeah, number of farms, is there, is there a relationship between the number of farms and productivity? Well, okay, now, now we really are going to start splitting hairs. Where are we talking about? Are we talking about the sugar economy? Which has been the paradigm for referring to Puerto Rican rural history? The island's economy did not simply revolve around sugar, although it was the major earner of foreign exchange. Are we talking about the tobacco country of the Eastern Highlands? Are we talking about coffee country of the Western Highlands? The coffee economy didn't disappear. And let me throw, so when you talk about productivity, we can't talk about productivity. We have to be very specific as to where we're talking about, which economic sectors we're talking about. And uh, in, in general terms, and Cesar, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Puerto Rico had one of the highest, uh, 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 at least with respect to sugar, extraordinary productivity per acre, no? Co correct, correct. Much higher productivity per acre than Cuba. And this is due to irrigation in the southern coast. So there was a tremendous increase in productivity due to capital investment and irrigation. But also in tobacco, there's a tremendous increase in productivity. Teresita, you wrote a book about this. Um, you know, due to agricultural extension and the introduction of new varieties of tobacco. So no, there isn't a story of stagnation there at all. Vast increases in productivity. Yeah, thank you both. And um, we have another comment in the in the chat. Cesar, maybe you want to start with this one. Um, so is the takeaway that large landowners benefited from U.S. colonialism while smallholders remained in more or less the same situation? No, that's, that's, you have to be specific. This is, we're not talking about simply a sugar economy. Um, you know, we're not simply talking about, I mean, a question becomes, and I'm just throwing this number out there, and Cesar knows more about this than I do in a sugar economy, uh, how did a colono make that as a producer of cane and not sugar who owned 100 acres of land or 50 acres of land or 20 acres of land? Question, that's one question. Second question, <clears throat> what about the coffee and tobacco sectors? And what about a sector of Puerto Rican society which has never been studied? And that is truck farming, production for local markets, production for the Plaza Mercados that appear in every major urban area of the island. This is a sector of Puerto Rican society that has been virtually ignored, even though the data suggests that there was more land planted in food crops for domestic consumption than planted in sugar or coffee or tobacco. All right, so the question is a simple question. The answer requires an extraordinary amount of, of, of nuanced consideration of different geographical regions and different economic activities. Thank you both. And, and because there are a lot of questions coming in, we are going to collect them and then leave them all for the end. Okay, so Laird, go ahead. So let's go back to this issue of land concentration. Now, again, we don't want to overwhelm you with 
numbers because you all get dizzy and think, oh, these are sterile numbers. These are not people, blah, 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 blah. Uh, a Gini index is a measurement of land concentration or income concentration. And what you simply have to see here is that the Gini index, that is the concentration of land, remains relatively stable between, as measured by the Gini index between 1910 and 1935. Again, to reiterate, perhaps ad nauseum, there is no process of land concentration in Puerto Rico. Okay. Now, let's take a look at landlessness, because this is the crux of this interpretation of the Legion de Propietarios, that Puerto Rican farmers were deprived of their land by these rapacious imperialist companies. We employed a methodology by looking at the Census Bureau's records, which indicated the number of families living in rural areas and average family size to determine in a very complex way, which I'm not gonna bore you with now, the number of families in rural Puerto Rico who did not own land. Now, the data here are very clear. Yes, there's an increase. But in 1899, 72% of all rural families in Puerto Rico did not own land. Now, that does not mean that they did not have use of fruct rights over land as agregados, as renters, as some other category. But ownership of land was very restricted at the moment the United States invades the island. And while landlessness increased somewhat, to 1935, a jump from 72.3% to 75.1% of families owning land is not very significant. In other words, this legion de propietarios theory of people being alienated of land just doesn't hold water when systematic data are analyzed. Okay. Now, here we get a little more sophisticated with our numbers and the story that they tell. Because we have looked at different socioeconomic zones. We looked at the 10 largest sugar districts, 10 largest coffee districts, 10 largest tobacco districts, and lo and behold, what do we find? In the sugar districts, yes, there's an increase. But as Cesar pointed out, and I reiterated, in 1899, when the United States troops disembarked in Guanica, 80% of all rural families in the sugar future sugar districts of the island own no land. That increased to 87% in 1930. Statistically significant, yes, but not very radical. When we look at the coffee districts, lo and behold, very little change. These are the districts, the municipios in the Western Highlands, which I mentioned before, 77% of all rural families in 1899 own no land. That actually declined somewhat to 75% in 1930. Again, legión de propietarios, mythology, as opposed to fact. In the tobacco districts, tobacco economies, if you, I advise you all to please go out and read Teresita's book and memorize all the numbers that you find there. Um, tobacco economies are very small scale. Tobacco farms are very fragmented. You're not gonna find very many large tobacco uh, farms in on the Eastern Highlands of the islands and in other regions where tobacco is cultivated. So you have in the, the largest tobacco districts, 73% of all families own no land. That declined to 67% by 1935. So once again, overarching generalizations about landlessness must be taken, must be submitted to empirical study. And despite the fact that Puerto Rico is a small island, there are different socioeconomic regions. And if you don't consider them, and utilize the sugar districts as a paradigm for understanding early 20th century Puerto Rican history, 
you're making a huge, huge, huge mistake, as so many scholars have done. Supporting evidence, the old Gini index. Land is much more concentrated in the sugar districts now. Gini index of 0.74. Coffee, less so. Tobacco, fragmented production, less so. All right. So once again, this is a powerful statistical indicator of the fact that um, uh, you have different patterns of land concentration depending on the socioeconomic zone of the island. That's it for this presentation. And I'm sure that many of you have questions. And I might also add here as a final series of comments, the conclusions that we've arrived at by examining systematic data suggest all kinds of opportunities for comparative study. What was the situation in Cuba? Different island, different economic structures, different trajectory in the expansion of sugar production, once again, which Cesar, Cesar had laid out in his book, American Sugar Kingdom. Would we find the same kinds of processes in Cuba or in La República Dominicana that we find in Puerto Rico? Are there systematic data sources that can be employed some of the hypotheses that we put forward or put forth in our book. I think there are many. Uh, there are obviously political implications to our study. Uh, and Cesar, if you want to jump in, I can stop. Uh, I just want to mention a few. The fact, and I think this is very important, and I don't want to offend anybody, there is not in Puerto Rico a large scale independentista movement in the first three decades of the 20th century. There are intellectuals, there are political figures that certainly believe that Puerto Rico should be an independent republic, but we don't find any mass opposition to US rule. One reason may be that there's no real deterioration of socioeconomic conditions among the vast majority of people. We are looking at a rural society, an agrarian society, and access to land is the key to understanding these societies. And access to land didn't change very much. There's no wholesale deprivation of land rights uh, to Puerto Rican rural residents, and for that matter, and, and that translates in political terms into the absence of any kind of large-scale mass movement uh, uh, seeking to change uh, the island status toward independence. Now, I know that these comments are pregnant with all kinds of possibilities and all kinds of uh, ideas. And with that, I close. Thank you, Laird. Cesar, do you have any finishing comments before we get to questions? Well, on the, on the political structures, um, just a brief comment. Uh, we're looking at three regions, the sugar region, the tobacco region, and the coffee region. And uh, tariffs are really, really, really important uh, because uh, uh, when Puerto Rico uh, is incorporated into the U.S. tariff system in 1902, around there, which means goods from Puerto Rico can enter the U.S. market as if they were produced inside the U.S. as opposed to outside, they stop being taxed uh, by the customs man in New York. So um, that means Puerto Rican sugar and Puerto Rican tobacco can enter the U.S. market on favorable conditions relative to Cuba and the Dominican Republic that have to pay tariffs on both products. And there are protectionist lobbies in the US. The sugar beet lobby is a very powerful lobby that was systematically opposed to the annexation of Cuba. They wanted Cuban independence because they don't want Cuban competition in the sugar market. And the same thing with about 17, 17 states that produce tobacco. They don't want the annexation of Cuba. So they want to kick Cuba out. But Puerto Rico in 1898 is a coffee producing country. It doesn't threaten anyone. It kind of slid through the cracks. It gets completely inco incorporated into the US tariff system. Then the boom happens. And systematically, you see going on to the 1930s that the share of, of the US sugar market, of the sugar consumed in the US producing Puerto Rico and Hawaii and a couple of other insular possessions increases dramatically. So this tariff advantage in the US market also served as a great uh, uh, 
this incentive to the pro-independence forces because rural producers uh, did not want to be independent and have to pay tariffs like Cuba or the Dominican Republic uh, in sugar or, or tobacco. So there is a conservative uh, element there because they are benefiting from this imperial structure. Um, you know, in the heights of the Great Depression, the year 1933, the price of sugar dropped dramatically to three cents a pound in the New York market, and the tariff was two cents. That means that a Cuban brings their sugar to the New York market. They get three cents with the sugar and they have to deliver two cents to the customs man in New York and keep one cent. Whereas the Puerto Rican brings it to the US market and keep the whole three cents. That's 300% of the Cuban price. So uh, I'm, look, I'm looking at the most dramatic example in years of, of better prices, the difference wasn't so big, but um, still it was a formidable incentive. The incorporation of Puerto Rico to the US tariffs Cesar, we have a question from Livia Gonzalez. Have you found United Fruit Company investment in Puerto Rico from 1900 to 1920? I haven't, no. Okay. I don't, um, I don't, I, I don't know that there wasn't, but I, I haven't found it. Okay, thank you. And a question from Aldo. Uh, municipal taxes based on land extension, land value, or value of production. Any good stats on small, small farm production values? Um, I I can give you the data, although, <laughs> although by the way, this is my, my college buddy. We went to college, to college together. Um, so I haven't crunched it, um, you know, but you can, you can kind of figure out uh, taxes per, per acre of land for small farms and large farms and so on from these data. Now, the formula that the assessors use, I don't know exactly. But the general principle was laid out the, the custom system in Puerto Rico was, was created by an economist at Johns Hopkins University professor called uh, Jacob Hollander, who was the founder of the so-called Neo-Ricardian School in US economics. And, uh, and Hollander uh, was very conscious that, um, that uh, 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 land values were based on the capitalization of income. In other words, uh, you capitalize the income, that, that the profit that you can make on, on a farm, say at the average bank interest rate, and that's the price of your farm, right? So they're looking at the income generating potential of farms to tax them. Um, and, but they divide it into, uh, that's why they do land values, which takes into account location. Then they look improvements to the land. Is there sugar cane planted on it, for example? And then they also look at, uh, uh, you know, tractors, horses, and so on. They tax that also. There was a, uh, a, a kind of revolt of the of the, of the local landowners in 1901 because the tax was originally set at two percent, and the U.S. market was still close to U.S. producers, and they said this is an expropriating tax to take over our land because we don't have to, the cash to pay for tax. Um, so the authorities reduced it to one percent, and then the news spread that Puerto Rico was getting free trade, and the protests completely dissipated. Once the producers realize they're gonna get tariff free entrance for the tobacco and the sugar into the US market, desapareció la legión, la, eh, la, ¿cómo se llama? La, la, la protesta, the, 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 the landowners stop protesting. Okay, I have a question for Laird. Um, Laird, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, from Joaquin, thanks Joaquin. Uh, Lair, can you talk more usufruct, more about usufruct land? Did usufruct land increase or decrease with the U.S. occupation? And if the number of usufruct land is unknown, would it be possible then to determine the number of landless peasants? Lair, can I talk about that? Oh, there you go. Yes, sir. Go ahead, man. <laughs> okay, so one of the things we do in our book is we compare uh, the municipality of uh, not Salinas, uh, Santa Isabel, to the municipality of Vieques. Vieques and, and, and Santa Isabel are the most extreme cases of pure sugar economies in Puerto Rico. In that practically 100% of the land is plant, planted in sugar cane. The big difference being that in Santa Isabel, uh, it was US corporate capital, the Aguirre Sugar Company, Lucia and Company. In Vieques, it was the Benitez family, a local, a local, uh, 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 you know, a part of the local oligarchy. Um, and the, the use of rights issue is a little bit different. It appears that the, the US corporation did not grant use of rights. Land was too profitable uh, to, to, to give farms 
one or two acres where they're planting fruits and so on. And they just planted everything in Cain. And it appears that in Vieques, the Benitez did land, did grant some use of those rights. But our sense, nobody can, nobody knows exact, we can't quantify this because aggregado contracts were more often than not, and the expert on this is Bregat, is they were more, more often than not oral contracts. Is that correct, Larry? Yeah, it's very rare to find contractual, written contractual uh, evidence of relationships between uh, landowners and the other rural categories, um, agregados, renters, parceros, or sharecroppers. We Medianeros, yeah. It goes on and on and on. Uh, owners of land that are capital scarce are trying to defray capital expenses by uh, securing labor from people uh, by granting them land rights in some way. But there are very, very, very few uh, examples uh, in the archival record that tell us the details. There are, I mean, to go back in the 19th century, uh, because of various anti-vagrancy laws that were passed in Puerto Rico, the most important and most well-known, which is the Ley General de Jornaleros of 1849, uh, there were other anti-vagrancy laws passed, anti-vagrancy meaning landowners trying to get people to get to work for them, uh, but the Honoleto Law of 1849 produced a long series of um, a written contracts in the notarial protocols of every town in Puerto Rico, uh, because uh, those who owned land, did not own land had to show evidence that they were working. So we have some notion of how these arrangements work back in the middle of the 19th century. That doesn't necessarily mean that these things are still valid for the uh, early 20th century. What does occur? And this is not really a direct answer to your question here because we don't know these arrangements. Uh, what does occur here is uh, the insistence by those who do not own land on being paid in cash. Uh, this is extremely important to understand because uh, it means that if you're paid in cash as opposed to vales or riles or in English chits, it means that you are mobile. You can move from employer to employer. The old 19, pre-1898 system was a system where there was very, very, very rudimentary circulation of cash. Workers on small farms, large farms, were paid by their employers in chits. Chits, which were redeemable in pulperias or country stores. They were not redeemable in the country store of a neighbor. They were only redeemable in the country store of the owner. So one of the great changes that takes place in the early 20th century, and I'm not passing judgment on this, was the beginnings of a real market economy for labor because people were paid in cash and insisted on doing so. The advent of the US dollar, has been seen as something negative, has been seen as a tool of imperialist domination. Maybe, maybe no. Uh, I think that in large part, uh, the downtrodden and humble workers benefited from the advent of a cash economy because it meant that they at least uh, had the possibility of changing employers. Uh, and so uh, I know I strayed a little bit away from what the question was, but at the end of the day, the answer is no one has written a doctoral dissertation or major book that I know of, correct me if I'm wrong, some of my colleagues out there, uh, that has examined this mass of landless people who did have use of park rights over land in the different economic zones uh, of the island. We have a question from Juan Delgado. Uh, what prevented or discouraged U.S. capital from investing in and expanding to small holding land areas in Puerto Rico? I'm well, sorry, can you repeat that question, Teresita? See. Si. Yeah, uh, profit profitability. What prevented or discouraged U.S. capital from investing in and expanding to small holding land, to small holding areas in Puerto Rico? There's no economic incentive. This is a question of productivity. You invest capital in places where you're gonna have the highest yields and returns. There's, there's, for example, it's, it's pointless for the American Tobacco Company or the Tobacco Trust to invest in cultivation. That's simply uh, an expenditure which uh, they don't have to do. There's a much higher rate of profit in manufacturing and export back to the United States. So there is an abundance 
an absolute abundance of labor in Puerto Rico because of, this may be objectionable to some of you, high population density, as well as rampant landlessness in 1899. And Cesar pointed out, uh, uh, and we point out in the book, that Puerto Rico is unique. Cuba had to import West Indian labor for the expansion of the sugar economy into Camagüey and Oriente, right? Puerto Rico exports labor. Never Even in the middle of the sugar labor yeah. for the expanding expanding sugar industry of the island. All right. So that is testimony to the our arguments about the widespread nature of landlessness on the island. There is an incipient proletariat, if you want to employ a certain uh, uh, vocabulary here, on the island when the United States invades in 1898. Okay, and Eduardo Contreras has a question for Cesar. If I understood correctly, the number of smallholders actually increased between 1910 and 1935. If yes, how do you explain that increase? Um, yes, there's two processes going on in here. Um, one of them is fragmentation of farms through inheritance, okay? A family has a farm, the parents died and they have six children. Now they have to distribute land to the six heirs, okay? And uh, the law in, in, in Puerto Rico does not permit primogeniture. In other words, all the children have to inherit. And um, so uh, uh, population growth and inheritance cause land fra uh, fragmentation. So that increases the number of farms, right? You have you know, a farm of 100 acres, maybe you have five, five farms of 20 now. Um, the other process that's going on is, is a kind of colonization and acquisition of new farms in the tobacco districts. Um, uh, uh, there, there is the possibility on years of good prices for medianeros, you know, or sharecroppers or whatever, to make enough money to buy themselves a little farm. And this is, this is uh, you know, the Brookings report of 1930 said that. So um, on years of good prices, uh, 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 renters could accumulate enough capital to buy a small farm. So there's actually a lot of startups going on and contrary to the, to the literature, um, uh, you know, a proliferation of small, small farm ownership. I should say something about the implicit scheme that uh, Puerto Rican uh, 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 scholars and I think much of the literature has taken, you know, you've all played the game Monopoly, right? They say the old American game of uh, getting rich without landing in jail, right? On the one hand, but the game Monopoly was originally created by a, by a populist from the People's Party at the turn of the 20th century, it was called the landlord game. Rexford Tugwell, incidentally, the governor that supervised the agrarian reform in Puerto Rico, introduced it to his economic students in Columbia University uh, in the 1920s. So what's the implicit notion there? The implicit notion there is that markets are great differentiators. In other words, you let loose a market economy, okay, and the rich will get richer, the poor will get, will get poorer. And if everybody starts equal, somebody's going to end up with wealth boardwalk and a whole bunch of other properties and everybody is going to end up this process. That was actually the message that the inventor of the game wanted to convey, which is that markets create inequality. This implicit notion is in all of the literature. And the problem is markets do different things depending on pre-existing structures and a lot of other circumstances, as we point out in our book. Depending on capital requirement and pre-existing uh, structures, markets may eliminate the number of producers or they may cause a proliferation in the number of producers. This is not an abstract theoretical question, you know, where markets always do this or always do that. Some of the biggest opposition to our early arguments came from Marxists who said, well, markets are great differentiators. And I have to quote to them an article by Lenin, uh, you know, from 1916 with data from the US census where he says, in the US South, he says in the Midwest, where the starting point is the family farm, the penetration of capitalism into agriculture leads to concentration. But in the US South, where the uh, starting point is the plantation, the penetration of capital into agriculture entails the fragmentation of farm ownership. You can't get a more orthodox Marxist view than that. Yet Marxists unequivocally have the monopoly game view of the matter, that markets are always um, 
uh, irremediably uh, uh, differentiators and, 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 and so on and so forth. So I don't believe it. I, I, I think depending on the context, markets may create this possession or they may create um, uh, new owners. Thank you, Cesar. And we have a, a question on the chat from uh, Jeff Burroughs, who's our own uh, resident expert on the Puerto Rican Reconstruction Administration. So I'm going to let him ask it himself. Yeah, thanks, Teresita. And thanks to Laird and Cesar. Uh, I read this uh, book quite eagerly, and this discussion is, is very, very valuable. Um, I just want to go back to usufruct rights a little bit, and I was wondering what evidence uh, you two have uncovered about uh, to what extent were those rights protected by uh, local law, by Puerto Rican law. Um, I know in my research, the New Dealers um, were very convinced that usufruct rights were protected by local law, and many of their um, actions were based on that, but I haven't been able to verify that in Puerto Rican legal codes or, or what. So I was just wondering if you, if you two had a, uh, any, any leads on that. I, I have a 20th century example, which is precisely from the island of Vieques. I mentioned earlier that I compared Santa Isabel to Vieques because Vieques was a feudo de los Benites, you know, it was a, uh, and, um, when the U.S. Navy took over the lands of Vieques to build a U.S. base in the 1940s, they did not recognize any rights for agregados, and the agregados received zero compensation. Uh, so, in fact, the U.S. authorities, at least the U.S. Navy, took the position of there is absolute private property here, not scalar property with some kind of feudal rights and so on and so forth. The landowner is the landowner. The landowner is going to get a paycheck from the Navy. Everybody else is going to get nothing. And they simply expelled these people. I have actually a book about this with Jose Bolivar. Uh, you can look at the little details in there. Of, um, so I don't think, you know, and Juan Justi would probably kill me for saying this because he, he probably say that I am arguing legally, and I'm not a lawyer, that agregados do not have rights because he does believe they have rights and, and that they can be restored. Um, but, um, the experience I saw, at least with the Navy, maybe, is that no, they, the, no, no property rights were recognized for agregados. Yeah, let me, uh, let me add to that. Uh, this is a gray area, Jeff, and I think that it's really uh, something that's quite interesting. Um, we have not found any, I've, I've not, Cesar hasn't, we together have not found any evidence of uh, any kind of legal protections to uh, to those without property, without property rights. So I think that there was a major, you know, as, as we point out, uh, the colonial regime that the United States imposes is a liberal regime in the sense that, and Cesar has pointed this out, it protects private property. Private property is sanctimonious, all right? And those who don't own property uh, <clears throat> get the extended middle finger of the free hand of the marketplace, you see. Uh, so, um, I think that's one thing. Uh, I can tell you, however, if there are any students out there who want to spend about a year, year and a half in the archives and work with systematic data, that throughout Puerto Rico, in private hands, there are account books that have been preserved by firms. They are not well known. I have seen many of them. And it's those account books which will record all of the details of the relationship between those who own land and those who are have use of our rights. Now, I worked with the, I've seen these. I can tell you where two giant archives are, and one in Jalco and one in Lares, in Castaner. Uh, one in La Senda Baliar uh, from the Castaner family. Uh, and one from Amel Julian Compañía in Jalco, and I went through these archives. The account books have been preserved back from the 1850s all the way up through the 20th century. Now, I was writing my study, my doctoral dissertation then, way back in the 1970s, and so I didn't look at the 20th century data. I only looked at the 19th century data. But in these account books, there are meticulous records about the obligations of those who have different arrangements with owners. Un agregado tiene responsabilidad de cuidar 50 cabras. 
for those of you who don't speak Spanish, uh, okay, we're giving you a piece of land here. You're going to take care of 50 goats. And, uh, or you're going to build fences along this area here. Or you're going to cultivate uh, this many coffee bushes. Or you're going to uh, plant platanos here and this and that and deliver to me at harvest time half of the produce. Now, these data are there, but you're not gonna find them until you get out into the field and go to the local archives and dig and dig and dig until you uncover more. And they're out there. But the way, the death of the social sciences, you'll forgive me, where systematic research has become passe, in favor of impressionistic and studies which revolve around imagine this and imagine that. That discourages doctoral candidates from getting out and doing the grunt work that those of us older folks did back in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. So the information is out there. Where are my PhD students that are gonna go dig this up? Let me know if you find one and you, and you send and you successfully send one out uh, for that. It'd be it'd be pretty great. I think I think Aldo just volunteered. <laughs> Aldo, did you want to make a comment instead of putting it in the chat? No. Aldo doesn't have enough to do. <laughs> he needs another book project. Any other comments? Questions? That's yeah, it. if I may. No one's what? taking no one's taking oh. us to task. Oh no no no! Here we go. Juan is Juan is taking you to task right now. Go ahead, Juan. Oh, Hola y saludos a todos. Si puedo hablar en español, pues. Oh Juan, you I was just talking about you. My God, I said you're going to be saying these about agregados. Okay. Qué remedio, qué remedio. Tenía que hablar. Y lo puedo decir mejor en español, así que me excusan. Vale, vale. Este, el libro, pues estoy eh, esperando con mucha anticipación leerlo, creo que es necesaria la, el, el análisis que hacen y la, el, el ángulo que, que toman. Este, pero la cuestión de los agregados siempre está, está, está muy presente. Primero sobre el siglo XIX, eh, porque entonces la, lo, que ustedes, lo que ustedes plantean, que me parece muy cierto, que toda esta mitología de la, de la propiedad de la tierra, pues está sumamente exagerada y que sobre todo en ciertas regiones de la isla, ¿verdad? El, el, eh, realmente lo que llegaron las corporaciones azucareras fue a, a, a apropiarse de bloques de tierra inmensos que ya existían. Este, pero eh, me parece que el, eh, si no, no eran propietarios, muy bien, pero entonces, ¿qué, ¿qué es lo que eran? Y entonces yo creo que, pues, eh, Vergad reconoce, y tú lo reconoces, la importancia de los agregados y, y lo ven como un tema que hace falta investigar y que mmm, no se han estado haciendo esas investigaciones que podrían haberse hecho ya desde hace algunos años. Pero creo que sugiere que la expresión de la tesis de ustedes, la expresión general de la tesis, pues eh, como que eh, pone a pensar en, en que se puede matizar este, y que... Pues sí, está bien, eh, contra aquellos que venían hablando de la legión de propietarios, eso hace 30 o 40 años, ¿verdad? sobre todo. Eh, pero yo creo que, que la tesis afirmativa de ustedes es muy importante, las sugerencias de investigación, me parece que son muy importantes, sobre el tema de, lo, de los agregados. Este, y, y creo que, que ojalá que aparezcan esos estudiantes y hagan las investigaciones. O sea, no basta con decir que no había los propietarios, pues es que evidentemente había unas relaciones de posesión sobre la tierra compleja, que solamente una investigación de microhistoria, quizás se han muerto ya los ancianos que hubieran podido ayudar a reconstruir parte de esa historia, pero historias a nivel muy local que podrían hacerse. La, los récords que menciona Vergad me parecen muy interesantes, de las haciendas. Este, pero eso es algo que, que para tomar en cuenta en el 19. Sobre el 20, mi pregunta es, de nuevo, sobre los agregados, pero que también, ¿cómo, ¿qué variaciones ustedes encontraron en las definiciones que hace el el Buró del Censo, en cuanto a farm ownership, del, del 10 al 20, al 30, al 35, 
eh, si varía o no varía, eh, particularmente con relación a tres acres o menos, y si, esa, si hay cambios en definiciones que ustedes creen que puedan afectar las estadísticas. Yo quiero empezar. Este, eh, eh, quiero decir que yo soy fanático del trabajo de Juan Justi, cuya, no, tesis, cuya tesis de 1300 páginas, aparte de su comité de tesis, yo tengo que ser el único en el mundo que se la ha leído. Eh, 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 con, de con, sugerencia, con sugerencias detalladas sí. con su, pero, y, y además tiene un, un, un artículo legal que es el único artículo que yo he visto en mi vida que tenga 350 páginas que se llama las concesiones de la corona con, con Michel Godreau sobre la, 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 la legislación sobre la propiedad de la tierra en Puerto Rico o sea que estamos hablando con el experto así que eso lo parte eh, eh, eso, este, Juan lo que dice el censo dice renters por ejemplo y aparte de eso, tú no sabes, o sea, es que en Puerto Rico, como tú bien sabes, había medianeros, arrendatarios, agregados, un montón de temas. Aparceros. Sí. Aparceros, etc. Nada de eso yo lo vi en el censo. Lo que dice rent a farm o, o, o own a farm. Entonces yo tengo la impresión que los que rent a farm son, son managers en el sentido moderno. Por ejemplo, este, o sea, una de las cosas que se da en Puerto Rico, por ejemplo, en el azúcar, es que eh, eh, los grandes terratenientes le rentan tierra a las compañías azucareras porque no quieren vender, las quieren seguir este, la, la, la quieren es, seguir explotando esas fincas tienen managers la verdad que yo no sé la pregunta no. digo no sé la respuesta no. y, y por supuesto, mira, creo que es importantísima tu pregunta por una cosa porque nosotros decimos no desapareció la legión de propietarios no había tal cosa. Y sin embargo, en la, en la memoria colectiva de, de, de Puerto Rico, ciertamente ese mito tiene una resonancia tremenda. Eso no era nada más que aviso. Eso era todo el mundo. Lo que nosotros pensamos es que el deterioro de los derechos de usufructo es lo que se va dando en el siglo XX y que la gente recuerda ese proceso como un proceso de desposesión. Pero no podemos probarlo. O sea, porque está bien que no desapareció la legión de propietarios, pero si no desapareció... ¿Por qué es tan fuerte el mito? ¿Por qué tiene tanta resonancia? ¿Por qué lo dicen todos los partidos políticos? ¿Por qué tanta gente se expresa de que, de que desapareció el pequeño terrateniente? Yo creo, mi, 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 ¿cómo se llama? mi hipótesis, pero no la puedo probar, es que lo que sí hubo fue un deterioro dramático de, del usufructo en la zona azucarera. Ah, oh, sí, eh, lo hubo, lo hubo. Sí, pero que no sé medirlo, porque, porque la sí. verdad que yo no sé cómo medirlo. El otro ángulo interesante es la migración, ¿verdad? De zonas de pequeño propietario, agregado, este, zonas cafetaleras, quizás en parte tabacaleras, de migraciones estacionales a la costa. O sea que eso sí lo bregamos en el libro. El, el issue de la propiedad, pues entonces está matizado por la, el tema de las migraciones estacionales y parte de lo que permite que la, ¿verdad? Las tenencias pequeñas persistan tiene que ver con esos procesos de migración. No eh, vimos Juan. ¿no? No vimos, Laird fue el que hizo esto, pero no vimos mucha evidencia de grandes migraciones estacionales porque lo que hacemos es buscamos sex ratios. Donde hay migraciones estacionales grandes, va a haber mucho más hombres en, en los municipios. ¿verdad? Por ejemplo, en marzo, que se hace el censo y en abril, que está en plena zafra, usted va a esperar un sex ratio y no, y, y no, no pudimos corroborar eso. Laird, no sé si tú puedes añadir a lo del sex ratio, pero no creemos que haya grandes migraciones estacionales, que era permanente la migración. Bueno, déjame hacer una sugerencia aquí. Voy a hablar en inglés porque hay mucha gente aquí que no habla en español. No, yo no sé sí, sí, sí. aquí, pero... No, no, yo, yo. Un poco de portugués, si se quiere. I'm going to speak in English here. Okay, first of all, there's another historical source which may be utilized, which has never been utilized in Puerto Rico, which can possibly reveal contractual arrangements between those without land and those with land, and these are the protocolos notariales. The protocolos notariales are all over the place. They're in every single town. I've worked with them in Lares. I've worked with them in San Germán. I've worked with them in Mayagüez. I've worked with them in the Archivo General. I've worked with them in Cialis. I've worked with them all over the place. The, 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 this is grunt work, all right? This is not going to an IPOMS data file, which I'm fond of. Uh, this is, you got to go out there and look for them and you got to read them. And anyone who's worked with historical documents knows that protoc protocolos notariales are giant tomes without indexes. You have to go through them page by page by page by page to find last wills and testaments, to find contracts between renters and property owners. 
I'm not going to guarantee you're going to find this information, but if it's there, that's where you're going to find it. All right. But what does that require? That requires dedication. That requires what I call grunt work. That requires wading through documents, not some down and dirty two month little project. This is a year, year and a half, two year project. You want to be a scholar? You want to be a historian? This is what you got to do. Okay. So that's one thing. And I think that it would be very interesting to see what would be turned up if some student, doctor student, would go down to the island and start working with local protocol notaries and find what kinds of contractual arrangements are there. All right, so I think that's um, uh, a second thing about migration, the demography. As I'm sure most of you know, and if you don't know, uh, the raw data files for 1910, 1920, 1930 have been released by IPOMS, thanks to the work of Scarano and his gang at the University of Wisconsin, who digitized the manuscript 1910, 1920 censuses. What that permits is an extraordinary slicing and dicing and nuanced presentation of data. And when we're, and as Cesar mentioned, we analyzed these files uh, very carefully. And we looked at this theme of migration because part of the uh, historiography of the island talks about massive migration from the coffee zones to the coast. Um, well, guess what? Was there migration from coffee zones to the coast? Sure, without question. Workers sought opportunities where there was, uh, where there were opportunities for employment if they were unemployed, and especially with short-term depression in the coffee economy after Sun City Aqua of 1899. Uh, however, there was not this kind of wholesale outpouring of people from the Central Highland Zones into the coastal sugar zones. Let me underline a demographic reality in Puerto Rico. And I'm emphasizing this because of the centrality of the sugar narrative. More people in Puerto Rico lived in the Western Highlands and Eastern Highlands and coffee country and tobacco country than in sugar country from a simply Human point of view, a larger share of the population, even by 1935, lived in non-sugar producing zones. Now that alone invalidates this part of the Puerto Rican 20th century history that focuses on uh, this paradigm of sugar as representative of the entire colonial project and the entire understanding of what's going on in the island. So uh, as Cesar mentioned, I'm gonna reiterate this, we proved this, this male migration certainly was seasonal, but what we find when we look at, my, at, at the sex ratio, uh, that is the number of men per number of women, uh, adults, children, however you want to look at it, it's parity. The same number of men and women are, are moving into the tobacco zones, moving into the sugar zones. That suggests family migration when migration took place. And that's also not to mention urban migration. Now, Puerto Rico remained a, a rural society, for sure. 70% of the population lived in rural areas in El Campo in, in 1940, 1935. But the urban population grew at a much faster rate, you see. If 30% of the population was urban in 1930, that's nearly half a million people. Whereas 15% of the population urban in 1899 was 150,000 people. So we also have to take into consideration this demographic reality when looking at rural societies, that you have this process, a very important process of urbanization. Who's going to the cities? Well, we have a chapter on demography there where we show in, in detail uh, that composition of, fan, of, of, of city populations. And again, it's not males leaving the press coffee areas, it's families moving with their kids. So hey. uh, some possible avenues of future research for future scholars and students. Thank you. Um, Jose Solá has a comment. Jose? Gracias, Teresita. César, uh, saludos. Uh, saludos, so, Jose. Uh, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate this. I, I, I actually have to confess, I already read the book quickly. Uh, so I spent the, the pandemic reading this wonderful uh, ton of statistics, beautiful book. So. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for doing this. I got a couple, two comments, maybe maybe three. Uh, in the issue of the agregados, and I want to go back to that, um, the 1935 census, the, the Prera census, especially the agricultural one, uh, the actual manuscripts, which are at the Centro de Estudios Históricos, or UPR, 
uh, next to the Department of History, you actually can see in it um, the questions being asked to the farmers or the individuals who own the properties, and then what they said, the amount of land they have, the kind of products. Among the ones that I see, and I, I studied Caguas, for those of you who don't know me, in 1935, there was a sugar farmer in Caguas by the name of Antonio Longo, <clears throat> who, owned, who owned large bass of uh, tracts of land. He had 300 agregados in his properties. Right? Uh, what happened to those agregados? And here, Juan, this is, will be something beautiful to see what happened to them later on. Uh, it will be will give us kind of a window into what happened to these farmers and where they go or these workers, you know, because they might be working for Longo, but also farming within that land. Uh, exactly what they were doing, I don't know. I never have come across of it. There's another. There's another source that I came across by chance. Uh, during the summer of 19, uh, 2015 at the Centro, uh, at the Archive of Ciencias Médicas, uh, uh, a questionnaire done by Ashford that he sent to farmers and landowners who are Puerto Rico to see the status of their workers uh, regarding the issue of uh, uh, hookworm. But within this questionnaire, he asked some of these guys to, uh, to answer further questions about the amount of property they have, the type of products that they were cultivating, how much of those products were in the land, you know, how many acres, is it how many workers there were there, are they resident workers, are they uh, people who came in, migrated? And you begin to see this kind of window in 1912 of the status of uh, the agricultural landscape in Puerto Rico and, and that was just sitting there. The other person I've seen it using it is Rosa Carraquillo, who wrote an article and she cited it and I decided, well, let me, I know Rosa because we were both graduate students together. And I went and checked. This is a learn. This is a beautiful for a graduate student to do an analysis. This it's a beautiful window in 1912 of this of the agricultural sort of landscape of the island. Uh, it takes a lot of work, guys, those doctoral students. Me and Teresita, we sucked it up. Uh, I think Aldo called us crazy for doing this. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you, you can actually get an idea. Uh, and I think bring the human aspect through our, our different works will add to the work that Cesar and Lerg have produced because it will be a nice complement to that myth that existed. You know, and Cesar hasn't talked about my buddies, the colonos, azucareros, you know, I, I'm amazed he hasn't mentioned them, uh, which are a big component of that sort of uh, group of sugar farmers who manipulated the system in their favor. Because guess what? When you get the free market in the United States open for you, why not sell sugar? Which is a question Francisco asked me to say, what's the motivation for these guys to do this? Like, well, it's the U.S. market. Say, so you need more than that. Uh, but which I actually found in Florida and I, I, is when I produce my next work, it's gonna be used. I mean, there is a Cuban saying in Puerto Rico, it is the, the, the benefits that they get that allows them to push forward and getting so involved in the industry. The argument will be better reframed later on, but that's where I'm going right now. But I appreciate for the moment. Thank you guys. Any, any, any feedback, Cesar or Laird, before we move on? Well, I think, so the agregado of this issue is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a huge issue. I was just reading an article today by Diego Ayala, happened to be my son, just published an article on, uh, on the agrarian reform and says that the land law of 1941 quotes the existence of 125,000 agregados in the island in 1940 or around there. So 125,000 people is a, is a lot of people. It's a this lot. Is, yeah. yeah. So, Awesome. Thank you. Diego, welcome. Now that you got put on the spot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, we have a question from Andreina. I thought you were going to read it. <laughs> oh, no. So, no, I, you were gonna <laughs> uh, I just want, I saw that you have data on based on gender. And I was wondering, because this is very hard, difficult data to find, um, if you saw anything interesting in terms of, of 
uh, women's access to uh, land tenure in that shift that you, uh, that period where you, that you analyzed? Well, uh, actually, Cesar, I, I don't have the numbers at hand, but we, we, in our tax record base, we calculated the number of farm owners that were women. Uh, I, I don't have that data in front of me, but some book that, that we I have think, a we have a variable called uh, gender, which is actually not exactly gender, it's type of owner. So we have male, female, sociedad, and sucesión. Okay, the, I think those are the four, the four, the way we coded it, right? Sucesiones are, you know, an estate is being broken up or something. Sociedades are, you know, corporations or, um, and I think, um, so two things, as I recall, women own under 15% of, 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 of the land or something like that. And there is no increase whatsoever. In other words, uh, we did not notice an increase in female ownership with time. Just kind of stable, patriarchal, male, la, you know, land, land ownership uh, throughout with, with no noticeable increase. This is what I recall. It's in the book, the, the facts. I don't have it top of my head, but I think very small share of ownership and uh, not improving. Yeah, we also have data on the book on uh, urban occupations of women and how that changed through time. Um, as some of you are, who are historians know that when you find the growth of urban areas, female populations are always larger than male populations. Um, <clears throat> there are specific reasons in agrarian societies what's, that that occurs. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the economic term, the marginal productivity of labor. Uh, but it's a very key factor in urbanization and industrialization where families are willing to part with their female members because they don't see them as productive as males. So you have a large, this marginal productivity of labor theory, uh, which is economic theory, uh, not very much in vogue anymore, is why you find large numbers of women in cities, uh, whether it's in slave-based societies or whether it's in, in uh, urbanizing societies. Now, one of the great changes that takes place among women in Puerto Rico is with respect to the occupational category. Now, uh, as you well know, uh, the controversial issue of the expansion of public education um, is um, something that provides all kinds of uh, occupational opportunities for women. And it's not just seamstresses and nannies and uh, uh, ironers and this and that that you find because we, the, the data in the, in, the, in the census records do indicate occupation. So there are data there. Uh, you should take a look at some of it. I don't have it off the top of my head. There's some dense statistical tables about the occupational structure of men and women in, I believe, 1910, 1920, and 1930. I, I'd like to add something uh, to the gender issue. I've seen so much, um, I have the same gripe as Laird, so much scholarship is uh, ideological political statements without, without, uh, without actual research, is that I've been crunching some numbers with this IPOMS data from 1910, 1920, and 1930. And there's data for occupations and the IPOMS actually, the census generates a variable, which is an income variable based on your occupation. Where they attribute to you the average income of that occupation and so on. And if you crunch that by race, in Puerto Rico in 1910 and 1920, you will find blacks have the higher incomes in the island. Uh, and, uh, and that's of course, because blacks are the most urban group of the population. Now, when you disaggregate and separate uh, blacks from whites, then in the cities, you know, whites make more, mulattoes, which are the three categories in intermediate incomes, blacks make less. But in the countryside, blacks remain with the higher incomes. Uh, in the census of 1910 and 1920. And this is probably due to the fact that they were concentrated in the sugar areas the, and that they were doing the skilled labor in the sugar areas because they have been involved historically um, with the sugar industry since the time of slavery and Sydney Mintz, as some ethnographic research suggests in this. But race is also complicated, not gender. And you know, you'd be surprised. <laughs> Blacks have higher income in the countryside than than mulattoes and whites in Puerto Rico in 1910 and 1920. Uh, so um, it can be dangerous to do this research. You know, this book by Laird uh, with Laird exposes me to the idea that I'm an apologist with for U.S. colonialism. Now this this research on race will expose me to the notion that I'm a white supremacist. Go figure. <laughs> 
Um, we have, I think, uh, Diego, I see you first. I want to, um, we have, we do have some students in the audience, which is awesome. And um, I think, I believe, Melly, if you're here, you can jump in, but um, she posted a question to asking about the type of research that you were talking about, the systematic data analysis and crunching of numbers. What organizations fund that type of research? <laughs> when you find out, let me know. Hustle, hustle, <laughs> hustle, hustle. Apply to everything and every, everything around. But it can't, I can't say that. Let me, let, me, let me digress a second because I have another uh, comment on historical sources, uh, which are, uh, to me, the center of all research. Um, it's not just local archives. It's not just account books. It's not just uh, protocol records, but how many of you have read through, those of you who are historians or those of you who are incipient historians, the reports of the governors of Puerto Rico, which had to be rendered every year according to law. Now, these are tomes which range from 1,000 pages to 1,500 pages. They're giant. And it's very tedious to pour through every single year between 1901 and when they stopped, I believe 1932, I'm not sure. But within these pages are extraordinary pieces of information. A absolutely extraordinary. I'm mind boggled when I read the political reports, when I read uh, the agricultural experimentation reports, when I read uh, all kinds of commentaries about rural society and urban society. So this is for students. This is a source which you can actually find online. All of the PDF files of every report of the government of Puerto Rico is available. So you don't have to go sit on your butt in archives for a year, year and a half. You can do it in the comfort of your own home, just like that. But there are valuable, valuable tidbits to be extracted from these reports, including on rural social relations on agregados, all kinds of detailed comments about uh, just every aspect of Puerto Rican life, data on education, data on, on uh, sex distribution of students, and on and on and on. Okay, now, where can you find research money for this? Write a good proposal, send it to the usual suspects, Social Science Research Council, National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, they're not going to say no to entertaining a solid application, but that's something for your advisors, whoever they may be, to counsel you on how to present a viable application for research funds. Now, of course, if you're a student at the Graduate Center in the City University of New York, you can apply to the Center for Latin American Caribbean Latino Studies because we offer some stipends for research. And uh, we're the only institution that does that in the City University of New York. And I think in CUNY as well. Anyway. Jose says it's better just to go to Puerto Rico. <laughs> um, Diego, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was just gonna say that I like we're talk that we're talking about the agregados as a sort of black box because I think another black box that I was that I found in the research for this article, I don't know actually, maybe I missed something but someone might have something to say about this, but is the parcelas. And a lot of agregados during the agrarian reform receive parcelas, maybe half a cuerda, right? And this is the most kind of socially, uh, the, the, the part of the reform with the biggest social ramifications. And I don't know, I haven't seen much, for example, as to food production in the parcelas, right? We know, for example, like that, you know, the sugar industry doesn't die immediately in, you know, after World War II, it takes like at least till the 1960s, right? To start really declining. And so I would, one thing I, I'd be curious about knowing, this would be an interesting thing. I don't know what kind of sources you could use, but food production in the parcelas, um, what did they do with them? I know a lot of them were organized in, in sort of urban, not urban, but sort of organized communities, right? With facilities, schools, so on and so forth. But, but yeah, uh, Right, because this is the first time that these we can talk about start talking about property, right? Um, for the agregados, so yeah, that would be an interesting question. So let me make a comment. First of all, we our book didn't go up that far. You're you're a little further ahead than us, Diego, but you're another generation, so that's what it's supposed to be. All right. 
So we, we, I didn't look at any of those documents and I'm not familiar with them. However, you have hit a nail on the head, which is of extraordinary importance and of extraordinary neglect. And that is domestic food production, right? We don't know anything about urban markets. We don't know anything about how it is that locally grown platanos, even rice, beans, garden staples were marketed on the island. We don't know that the railroad system, for example, which was obviously built first in the 19th century to service the coffee economy, then in the 20th century quite clearly to service the sugar economy, but the railroad may have been an extraordinarily important mechanism to move food products from rural areas to urban areas, right? We don't know anything about that. We don't know anything about that. And we have a chapter or a section of a chapter says, so I forget, which some, some reader forced us to write, we won't mention his name, about, uh, <clears throat> about domestic food production, about the percentage of food that was produced in Puerto Rico, because the stereotypical image is that we have a dependent colony that imports food from the United States, that it's totally dependent on the United States, that has to pay for food. That's not the case. A huge share of food consumed on the island, uh, as uh, studied by certain people, was produced locally. We don't know anything about distribution networks. We don't know anything about the advent of refrigeration. We don't know anything about how Plaza Mercado is operated. We don't know anything about their credit systems. We don't know anything about their transportation systems. We don't know anything about their storage systems. Uh, and I suspect that this is an extraordinarily important source of income for rural residents and also for middlemen as distributors in urban areas. Big black hole, nothing done. Students, do you hear me? Do you hear me out there? Do you see the possibilities of historical research? Uh, for researching the island's history. And I might add that since I have dabbled in Cuban history on occasion, as some of you well know, these same kinds of questions can be posed with respect to Cuba and internal marketing and internal production for, for domestic markets. So this is a big, big blank area. And, you know, for an incipient historian who's going to write a doctoral dissertation, I think this could be something, uh, a theme of, of extraordinary, extraordinary uh, helpfulness in understanding early 20th century history of the island. And then let me go on while I'm pontificating here. How about dairy products? What Are, products? Dairy products. Dairy. Is milk, uh, yogurt, these kinds of things. I remember the first time I went to the island, which was uh, 1967, somewhere back there before many of you were born. Uh, and I had a friend whose uncle had a dairy farm. And I don't know what, uh, why, why I was interested in that. I was only about 19 or 20, but I said, can you take me to this place? And I was impressed. There were cows, there were milk machines, but they were all Puerto Rican owned, right? There wasn't a great imperial monster here, right? So what about dairy production? What about the consumption of milk? What about the consumption of eggs? What about the consumption of uh, cheeses? Uh, even if it's, if it's only queso blanco. Uh, how many families were sustained by the production of food crops for urban markets, urban markets which were growing in significant numbers, in significant quantities? Just some provocative food for thought there. Thank you. And there's a comment in the chat from Lisa that she actually appreciated reading the part in the book about food production. So you got a thumbs up for that. So thank you, Lisa. And, and uh, William Suarez is saying, what about cured meat? That would be another one, right? Another thing that, that we haven't studied. Who knows? Nobody knows, right? Um, uh, Cesar Laird, we have about seven minutes left or so. Do you have any closing remarks? We don't have any, any hands raised or questions in the chat. I'm gonna go first and let Laird finish. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's a it's a small island with 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 big questions. I, I I should say you know it's it's amazing how complicated this place is uh, when you actually start looking at it and you know it looks small geographically, but it is immensely complex. And just the fact that uh, it has three regions, you know, tobacco, coffee, uh, and, and sugar, which are exporting products, but also. Uh, 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 food growing regions, uh, which are 
different from each other, not just in the crop that they produce, the entire socioeconomic system is different in the coffee region, from the sugar region, from the, from the tobacco region. Class relations are different. The level of dispossession are, uh, is different. Uh, the level of land ownership. So um, lest you be discouraged, these small islands still has a whole galaxy of things to be explored. That's all I'd like to say to close. Thank you, Cesar Laird. Uh, well, I guess that, um, as I indicated earlier when I began my comments, that I think that our study perhaps can open up some possibilities for comparative research and a reevaluation of the impact of 1898 on the region. And I don't mean a reevaluation that seeks to justify or laud uh, U.S. imperialism or U.S. colonialism or neocolonial whatever you want, but how does this monumental process of change, which begins in 1898, impact people in their daily lives? Is the narrative to revolve simply around the political structures of colonialism, imperialism? People love this stuff. People love to rail against US imperialism and US colonialism and blah, 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 yak, yak, yak. What did this, these processes, these are historical processes that were unleashed by 1898. How did these processes impact people in their daily lives? Who lost? Who benefited? What kinds of improvements existed? All right. In other words, get away from the narrative that revolves around victimization and the big bad, we know they're big bad imperialist aggressors. We know they're racist. We know the kinds of political structures that are imposed upon peoples, sometimes cooperatively, sometimes against their will. But how did the common person fare in this new world that was created in the first three decades before the Great Depression in the Caribbean? And I think that what our study does is make some suggestions for possible comparative research. Cuban history is not what it's all cranked up to be. That is, we don't know more than we know because Cuban history has been subsumed by the imperialist paradigm. Uh, the Depois de Triunfo in 1959, this is the obsession of everyone to write about the evils of colonialism. How did people's lives change? How did common people who lived in rural areas and rural societies live their lives? We don't have to attach values better or worse, but what were the dynamics of those lives? What was transformed? So I hope, uh, as all professors do, that uh, this work of ours uh, raises more questions than it answers and stimulates future research. And that's my closing comments. Thank you so much, Cesar and Lair. There's a, a lot of chat, uh, a lot of activity in the chat about the book's price and is it available in a library? And Cesar wrote that uh, UCLA, um, the library has access through their own library. So um, just check. On, online access. So Online access. Online. Maybe many has it online, I don't know. So check, so check digital libraries and, and see if, if you can find it that way. And Oscar just said, I have the PDF. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, I want, what, what about our royalties? <laughs> Listen, thank you so much to everybody who has stayed with us until the very end. It's such great, so great to see all of you. Thank you, Cesar. Thank you, Laird, for doing this our, and for being so patient with us. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you. I want to thank Teresa Cita, and I want to thank one. all of the staff at the center for yeah. making this possible. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Did to put together an event like this, so muchísimas gracias y hasta la próxima. Buenas.